turn this on. You're being very good, Peanut. He's a good boy. I told you not to go in those bushes, son. I can't help what happens to you over there. <laughs> to hear the UPS bark. <laughs> Good morning, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T-Touch practitioner for animals and people. This is Tristan, he's a corgi, and we're here for an episode of Conversations with a Corgi. And we have a special guest today, Peanut, who's over here, who developed something that I have seen quite a bit in humans after a stroke, and quite a few times in cats, but only twice before in a dog. And it's something called Horner syndrome, where they get a drooping in the eye or both eyes. And there's a bunch of different causes. So we're going to talk about that today while I work on this young man. So Tristan's going to go visit Peanut's mom. Come over here, little man. There's a little wiener. Can you see the wiener? You might need to bump this down. It's... I think the wiener's in the view. So... Horner syndrome has several different causes and um, they all involve a problem with the sympathetic nervous system. Your nervous system has an autonomic part and parts of the autonomic system are the sympathetic and parasympathetic, which we've talked about before in terms of T-touch and cranial work, which rebalances those two. This mask is gonna fall over my nose, but that's the way it is. So. What happens is the parasympathetic nervous system is the peaceful part, parasympathetic piece, where you're in the rest digest mode. The sympathetic part, sympathetic stress, that's when you're in your stress mode. And that controls us all the autonomic nervous system. Things like your heartbeat, your breathing, sweating, you know, the things that are automatic, so they called it autonomic. So what happens when you have Horner syndrome is that the uh, sympathetic nerves to the face have some kind of damage or impingement that creates what Peanut had, which was really strange drooping in the upper eyelid and then almost a lifting up of the lower eyelid and the eye kind of rolls back to the side. It's bloodshot, it looks awful. And he had it pretty significantly on his right side and less so on his left. And I don't know if you can see his eyeballs this morning, but after a session yesterday, he's looking much better. So there's several different things that can cause this, one of which is a stroke um, or some other, you know, a, a infarct in the brain, a blood clot. Um, one of the other dogs I've seen with this, in fact, was a terrier in a breed prone to blood clots. And that's actually how we helped diagnose um, all of his problems, which were coming from blood clots. <clears throat> and uh, another issue can be a problem uh, created through um, damage to the nerve uh, from uh, damage to the neck or the shoulder, which is what this little guy had wrong with him because he got picked up a little incorrectly and had a little impingement in his arm and that kind of gave him a little kind of neck whiplash. And so, <laughs> I'm screaming out another mouth. This one's okay. So he ended up with some tension in those nerves that was abnormal. And then there's several disease processes that can create this as well. And, you know, in the people, as I said, all the people I've seen with this have had had a stroke. Um, there's a whole bunch of other neurologic issues, such as severe migraine headaches and things like that, that can cause this. Anybody who's had a bad migraine can vouch for the fact that it uh, affects your eyes and you can't see very well. So what I did for Peanut is what I'm doing now. I did a cranial session and I'm starting by releasing his thoracic inlet area because all the nerves going in and out of the head, well, little peanut, <laughs> have to pass through this area and you don't want to get backflow congestion if this area is not freed up before you start to work higher up. So I'm just going to do this uh, at the base of his neck and then up by his head um, just to make sure all of the vessels with blood and lymph are freed up before we start working more directly on the things that were his problems yesterday. 
So he had a pretty significant injury to his left shoulder. And who knows? I mean, we think he got picked up a little incorrectly, but it could have been just running. The other dogs I've seen, except for the terrier, who had the problem, um, had it from like rough and tumble in the yard where they were, you know, or a, a dog like a border collie running to catch a frisbee and the dog keeps going, but the neck doesn't. And they end up with this kind of whiplash thing that does damage to these sympathetic nerves. So uh, you'll notice often on the side with the eye droop that there's weird sweating or lack of sweating and also a hot ear. Was one of your ears hot, Peanut? <laughs> he says, I don't know. You're a good boy. And he was he was very typical. After his cranial session yesterday, he slept for hours and hours and hours very deeply, ate his dinner, had some pee-pees, and kept sleeping. So that's pretty common after some kind of recent issue and a cranial session because it allows your body to go really deep to process what's happened to you. Right, Peanut? And Peanut recently also had an emotional issue because his actual brother and lived with him his whole life for 14 years brother just had um, to cross the rainbow bridge after having cancer so that was about two weeks ago so peanuts had to cope with a lot of emotional issues right now too and he is a kind of a caretaker dog he always wants to help his people and when I used to work on his brother he would always come over and put a paw on him or lick him or just be nearby to make sure we weren't messing anything up <laughs> when we were working on him You get stung on your ear, Tristan. He's having a little itching. So before I go up to the next part of this little wiener, I'll show you on this skull, which is a fox. The nose is at this end. So these nerves start in the middle of the brain in the hypothalamus. They come back, go down the neck, turn around, and then come back up to the eyes. So you can see how they would be injured, like jerking a dog on the collar straight up because that's right where the nerves go by. But in a lot of breeds, um, the way their necks are shaped, whether they're long or short necked breeds, there can be other issues in their body that can create this problem. Um, in children, there's a situation that occurs where they get yanked sharply upward by their arm if like they're crossing the street and the mom grabs them really quickly. and that usually uh, manifests more as a really significant shoulder issue. And I've seen a few kids with that, but every once in a while you get a Horner syndrome with that because the neck and the arm are connected. And if you get a sharp jerk up on the arm, the neck can be flipped one way or the other and also create this damage to the sympathetic nerves. And in the veterinary literature, they tell you not to worry about it too much. It resolves in four to six months. But you know, we were lucky that I know cranial work um, and Peanut happened to be in the area because it, without this work, which works directly on the nerves, it would be hard to know what to do. And I am sure if this happened to somebody, like any of you guys listening, like Danny in South Dakota, if there was a T-Touch practitioner in your area, I am sure I could talk them through how to work on this for you because there's so many T-Touch techniques, that's Tellington T-Touch, that do similar work to what the cranial work would do. So the other thing that Peanut really needed yesterday, which we will not be showing right now, is a good chiropractic adjustment to his neck, the base of his skull. He had a few vertebrae out in his lower back, but generally he's been pretty well adjusted um, in his spine for a long time. And you know, he's a really long dachshund <laughs> and he has a little roach in his back. So he needs um, pretty good chiropractic care, but he's been maintaining really well for many years. He does a lot of uh, walking, so he gets a good workout every day with his mom. He walks miles, he climbs hills, which is really good because he lives in New Hampshire. And hill climbing is good to keep the patella strong in his back legs and also to keep his butt strong, which helps um, take some of the weight off of his front end, which for a wiener is a good thing. He says, I'm feeling very sleepy again. <laughs> So watching this work is pretty boring, but people have always asked if I could show some of it sometime. And I happen to have this opportunity today to show you Peanut. I don't have my glasses on because they fog up really a lot when I'm wearing a mask. So I can't really read what you're saying, but I'll answer your questions. 
um, when I post this later. The other area that this um, sympathetic branch goes to is the ears. And I'm sure my sister, who has cavaliers, would tell you that most commonly when she's seen Horner syndrome, it's coming from an ear infection. And one of her cockers, I believe, actually had this from his chronic ear infections. That would have been scalp. So, you know, <clears throat> that's, and this, this is a dachshund. He has floppy ears. I mean, he could have had an ear infection that prompted this, but he's not had an ear infection. And one of the things that these two dachshunds in particular do, they often like to sit with their ears up which gets a little air in there. It's like, it's like turning on the air conditioner. It cools their bodies. So I don't think either of these guys in 14 years have had an ear infection, have they? Never. <laughs> so that would not have caused this. So in his case, it was a straight up kind of orthopedic problem that was the genesis of this. And I have to say, in the cats, it looks really weird because the pupil will be very small, and cats have different eyes from us anyway, so you'll see this one pupil really small and leaning way off to the side like a wall eye, and then the top lid drooping and the bottom lid weirdly coming up, and it looks really uncomfortable, especially when we had him in the sun yesterday and it was hot out. He couldn't really close um, that eye easily. He had to, like, you know how you kind of squint by scooching your cheek up, and uh, today is much better. Aren't you, Peanut? So his session yesterday was around 10 in the morning or so. And was it that late? Maybe it was at 9. And he was pretty much better by like 3 or 4. <laughs> you can talk, Heather. You can tell us things. Do you want to tell us what happened, what you noticed about him? You have to come over here, though, so that the mic can pick you up. So... <laughs> it might be a little barking. There's a dog coming. Oh, that's okay. Doorbells. Doors, doorbells will ring. Do you want to tell us what happened to him that you noticed? Um, after about five, six hours after the session, the, is it, what, the what is it, like a third eyelid or yeah. something? Um, that really diminished. Oh, so he was um, okay. significantly That's diminished good. after that. Yeah, the third eyelid um, naturally will half close when they get this to try to protect the eye. And how did you notice that he had this? How long do you think he had it? From like what happened? From the moment we woke up. Yeah, they um, just woke up in the morning and, and one eye was droopy. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, fortunately, we've always seemed to caught things right away because I fed him in the morning and he had one eye and it wasn't very severe it was maybe only half and then um a half hour later it was both eyes and it wouldn't go away um, so we were fortunate yeah we were down here like you said oh hi we're all excited because there's a dog jogging by Bisky. duck breath. And I know it looks like a big wiener. It's a dappled hound that this uh, neighbor of mine adopted. It's a really cute dog. All right, kids, calm down. And the significant rest, I think, as well. It was more than normal. Um, Yesterday? Like, yeah, yeah. Like you said, he's been going through it. He's been very sad. Can you sit down, please, honey? There you go. Get your tail in because it's going to get stuck. <laughs> but like when we arrived here, you know, you know, he was like, thank you for that. That really <laughs> helped me through Aww. yesterday. I love looking through my those wiener. eyes. <laughs> and he's a dappled wiener, so his eyes are this kind of gray-blue color. He's really handsome. So I know that a lot of people that are, uh, you know, highly trained medical professionals who might be skeptical of cranial work would be like, how can you do this? But, you know, elect electrically, <laughs> it's not that hard to connect with a nerve, especially in a dog like a dachshund. It doesn't have much hair and it, they're pretty 
close to the surface, although some of them are under the skull. That I can see why people would be skeptical. But if you've done this work as long as I have and worked on so many animals, you've felt so many things. And it's, it really is just like completing that electrical circuit. Um, I have a little toy I show people that squeaks when you put your hand on the two electrodes on the bottom of it. And you can hold hands in a circle and make the circuit. And then you can break your hands in that circle and also stop it, the circuit and have the animal stop squeaking. But what I do in big classes, we can break the circle in five or six places around where people are holding hands and we can still connect the circuit by just intentioning energy. And if you wanna know more about that stuff, you can read books by Lynn McTaggart and by Greg Braden um, and other ones. There's another guy named Oshman, O-S-C-H, who wrote a lot of books about energy medicine. And really that was the basis of homeopathy and flower essences and even herbal medicine to a certain extent. And one could make the argument that it's even the basis of conventional medicine because as much as we're studying chemicals and their effect on the body and chemicals that are missing and replacing chemicals, those chemicals still all have a frequency that is either resonating with the body or not to be helpful or not. Oh, the hound is now barking because he knows there's dogs up here. So I really can't read anything you guys are saying, but <laughs> um, rather than have you sit here and watch me while I do this for an hour, I'm going to end this uh, video here. <laughs> you have to listen to all the barking again. So thanks for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow for another episode of Conversations with a Corgi and a Dachshund.